Hello, people of Minnesota. I'm really excited to announce that the Trap Set Live is coming to St. Paul. On Tuesday, November 21st, I'm hosting a panel with Eric Kamau Gravat, who played with Weather Report and McCoy Tyner, Lori Barbero of Babes in Toyland, Gordy Knudsen from the Steve Miller Band, and Todd Trainer of Shellac. It all goes down at 7 p.m. at Vu Curie, 408 St. Peter Street in St. Paul. And best of all, it's free. That's Tuesday, November 21st. Hope to see you there, Minnesota. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. You're hearing The Window by Thrice, featuring my guest, Riley Breckenridge on drums. Formed in Irvine, California in 1998, the band was born of the Orange County hardcore scene, but its music soon proved resonant with a wider audience. A lifelong athlete, Riley aspired to become a professional baseball player, and he brings a meticulous athletic mindset to his playing. Aside from his work with Thrice, Riley plays in Less Art, a band that draws inspiration from his early influences such as Drive Like Jehu and Unwound. He's also spent time as an advice columnist, and I first met Riley through his excellent baseball podcast, The Prodcast. Thrice is set to begin a U.S. tour later this week, and now my conversation with Riley Breckenridge. Uh, I wanted to play football for years, but my parents wouldn't let me um, because they figured I'd get hurt, and that ended up being true (laughs) later. (laughs) Um, But I was pretty sports-minded. My dad was big into jazz um and my mom was into like zeppelin and the beatles so music was always on in the house but um it was kind of like a secondary thing for me when did it start to become more central to your life Mm, it was kind of a weird turn of events like i I was totally sports minded uh high school i was all about sports um my parents finally caved and said yes we'll let you play football uh going i guess my jun- half of my junior year into my senior year. So the summer going into my senior year, uh, we were doing this passing league thing, which is basically just skill positions and it's flag football and it's supposed to be safe and just a way for teams to kind of get a feel for the guys that they're going to use. And uh, I ran a deep route and had to jump up to catch this pass. And I jumped up and my eyes were on the football and I came down straight-legged on my right leg. <sighs> and as soon as I looked down... Ugh. I saw a guy right in my field of vision, like so close to me that like I could have kissed him. (laughs) And all of a sudden my right leg bent at the knee in the wrong direction. And that changed everything. I mean, I tore three ligaments in my knee, I tore cartilage, um, and I wasn't able to play sports for like 10 months. And that was when I started playing drums. God's way of telling you to (laughs) play drums. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I've talked about this with folks like Dale Crover, but did you feel like there was this kind of like mutually exclusive quality to sports and music when you were in high school? Like the musician kids hung out in one group and the sports kids hung out in another group? Yeah. So did you have an identity crisis at that time? Um, A little bit. I didn't, I didn't really feel it as much until we started touring and then I'd try to talk to talk to guys we were on tour with about sports, and they're like, "Ugh, sports! What are you, jock?" I was like, eh, "Yeah, kind of. Used to be. Would still love to be, but um, 
I don't know why there is that divide. I guess it's partially because, you know, the stereotypical jock is kind of a jerk. Um, but um, I don't know. I see, I've seen recently um, that that line has been blurred a little bit. Like there are more guys that want to talk sports or want to watch a game with you or go to a game on an off day or something. So that's been pretty cool. I think especially once you get a little bit older, people are less concerned with seeming like consistent, uh, right. Or, you know, less reserved about being interested in certain things. Right. Yeah. You don't need certain, uh, hobbies to define you as a person when you're older, I guess. So when did you start touring? Bryce started touring, I guess in like 99 or 2000. Um, and you know, in those days it was pack every, everything into this super crappy van that we probably bought for like anywhere from 800 to 1200 bucks that was like falling apart and um just hope that you don't die going from show to show um yeah so this was about mm, maybe like five years or six years after you stopped playing sports you kind of made the transformation or yeah so i i hurt my knee going into my senior year uh played played half of my senior baseball season Then I went to college and uh, I walked on at Pepperdine and played baseball for two years Um, and then wasn't playing as much as I wanted to, but uh, was probably playing as much as I should have because it's a really good program and I didn't really have any business being there. Um, So then I transferred to a junior college in Huntington Beach to try to, you know, get some at bats and play regularly and then try to latch on at another four year school. so I played at, at Golden West Junior College in Huntington and then ended up going to Long Beach State and trying to play baseball there and realizing that I was going to be in a similar situation to Pepperdine where I'd work my ass off and maybe get 10 at bats in a season. And I was like, I can't, this is not worth it. Like, I know, I know that I want to be a, a pro baseball player. I know that I want to keep playing as long as, as I can play. Um, but it's just not, the cards are not, you know, lining up for me. So it's not going to happen. So that's when I was like, I'm going to get my degree. Um, I'm going to focus on music a little bit more, focus on my social life or whatever else. And, um, maybe just put baseball to bed for a little bit. And it's still to bed. It's not. I play in a men's league on weekends. Awesome. <laughs> and you have a baseball podcast. Yes. It's, uh, I guess, on hiatus right now. We, we probably haven't done one in about a year, but that's been more because I've got two young kids and uh, scheduling is tough. Um, both myself and my co-host are in fairly active bands, so um, it's tough to find time to get on Skype and bang one out. When do you remember drumming really taking hold in your life and feeling like it was important to you? Mm, I guess it wasn't until around the time that Thrice started uh, actually needing to to play more shows. Um, so that 99, 2000 uh, time frame, I guess. And this was after college for you? Yes, like I was right just finishing up college. Um, did you have a plan for what you wanted to do with your life before the band became really active? Absolutely not. <laughs> so, so you'd kind of put baseball to bed and, and what were you studying in college? English. Okay. Which was a terrible decision. I'm not really, I'm not really good at making like firm decisions. So, uh, when I went to Pepperdine, I was into radio and TV, uh, both production and like on camera or on, on microphone stuff. Um, and I was really into that. But baseball was more important to me than than doing that kind of stuff. So I went to, you know, the junior college and just took bullshit classes so that I could spend my time focusing on baseball. And then I went to Long Beach uh, because a couple of my friends and my girlfriend at the time went there, and I've just figured that it would be the path of least resistance. Um, so I did that, and I show up uh, to my meeting with my academic advisor. And she's like, okay, well, what, what do you want your major to be? I'm like, oh, well, I'm really into TV and radio. And she's like, well, we don't offer that here. <laughs> I was like, oh, crap. Well, I don't know what I should do. And she's like, oh, you got straight A's in English in high school and at Pepperdine as well. What if you got an English degree? And at that point, I was just like, yeah, 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 okay, whatever. 
So are, are you into literature? Uh, no. So you just kind of did it to do it. I, I, I was really into the writing oh, aspect. Okay. Um, I do like reading, um, but I think being an English major in college turned me off of literature in a big way and turned me off of reading just because we had, to, we were forced to read things and I'd take like literary criticism and they'd say like, well, what do you, you know, can you uh, critique this James Joyce book? Right. Like, I don't know what the fuck he meant. He was a like, well, hammered Irishman <laughs> just writing stream of consciousness stuff. Like how, how am I supposed to parse this? I guess I'm not inviting you to my Bloomsday celebration next year then, bro. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I studied English uh, for my first year in college, mm -hmm. and the thing that turned me off the most w uh, was the other students. Like, I remember taking a poetry oh, class, God. and it was just like, God damn, yeah. like, I can't be around these people. Yeah. <laughs> it was so Cr awful. <laughs> crazy, pretentious. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't stand that either. <clears throat> so I went into my own pretentious world of music instead. Yeah, same here. <laughs> All right, so you didn't really have like a life plan, and and was it really, like, was it a goal of yours ever to become a working drummer? Not really. I mean, it was something that was in the back of my head, but it was never, not like the most self confident guy. Um, so it was always like, oh, it'd be really awesome if I could do this for a living, but there's no way that it's going to happen. There's just no way. So, but you had the confidence to pursue baseball, which seems even crazier it's in some way ways. stupider but i think maybe failing at that made me worried about failing you know jumping into another field that is also high odds but also there must be something that, that appeals to you about gambling with your life <laughs> <laughs> The Trap Set will always be available for free, but we rely on donations from our listeners. Please visit our website at thetrapset.net and click donate. Subscribe to our show on iTunes. And if you enjoy what you hear, give us a review. Uh, my father was a lawyer and my mom was mainly a stay at home mom. But then I could think like around third or fourth grade, uh, she became a medical assistant and worked doing that and then she's gotten into acting since then oh really not like serious acting just i mean it's serious to her but um like local well, slow down man. local theater <laughs> i mean they could have been like oh riley's little band you I, i'm sure they mom. were oh, okay so then it's just then she deserves it yeah <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like you had a natural aptitude for playing no what did you do to get good uh, I don't think I'm good. Okay. <laughs> um, but do you really believe that? I think I'm okay at what I do, but yeah. I realize that what I do is maybe not enough for most drummers. Well, I mean, there's got to be some part of you that thinks you're good enough for people to pay money to come see your band play and to, and to buy your albums, right? Uh, I struggle with that sometimes. When you record an album, do you ever feel like it's good enough? Or do you no. like hear problems with your playing? No. I go through phases like in writing and recording and then like listening to mixes. And then when you sit with the finished product for however many months the record rollout is, I go through phases of, wow, we, we, we did a pretty good job. And then, oh my God, this is terrible. Nobody's going to like it. Uh, we should have done this. We should have done that. We should have done the other thing. And then I'll revisit it a week or two later. And I'm like, yeah. Like, I think it's all right, but it just up and down and up and down. I think that's relatively normal, but I wonder sometimes if it's, uh, if it's beneficial to kind of aspire to be kinder to yourself. And I wonder if that kind of like, um, pressure that you put on yourself is constructive. Do you think it's constructive in your case? Uh, I do to a certain extent. Um, I think all the guys in thrice are pretty hard on themselves. Um, and pretty introspective. So it makes us, 
Were you guys all raised Catholic or something like that? Or like, what's the deal? Uh, I, th- I think we were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it, it uh, makes us pay more attention to detail, but at the same time, it also uh, makes us vulnerable to overworking and, you know, just beating stuff to death uh, during the writing process. Yeah. Like lately I've been exploring the, the notion that, um, you know, maybe I should be motivated by joy instead of like self-loathing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I've seen how that's working out. Yeah. It's a novel concept. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have fun when you play a show? Yes. If, if it's a, if it's what I think is like a pretty good show. Yeah. Um, and or, what percentage of the time do you play a pretty good show? Ooh, I'd want to say ninety-five okay. percent okay. of the time. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I might have shows where, you know, I jazz up a fill or something, or get a little sloppy, or. Um, I'm not nailing stuff the way I feel like I can nail it. Or maybe it's like a whole band thing where we're not super tight and snappy with stuff. Um, but you know, there, there are shows that are like that, that if the crowd is awesome, it doesn't matter. But if the crowd seems kind of lukewarm and we have kind of a so, so show, it's kind of a bummer, but, um, then I have to kind of go back into my brain and say, wait a minute, you're playing drums for a living for people. They're paying money to come see you. There's no reason, like, you shouldn't be doing this, really. So be happy to be here. <laughs> Was it a surprise to you when the band took off? Yes. What happened? Uh, I don't know. I, don't, I can't explain it. We, just, we were playing a lot of local shows. We started touring out a little bit with um, some friends' bands, just kind of expanding the radius of cities that we would hit um and then somebody who wrote an article for a local zine for us got our record in the hands of lewis from hopeless records um and he loved it and wanted to sign us and they put out illusion of safety in 2001 i want to say 2001 or 2002 and for some reason People really enjoyed that record and really enjoyed the live shows. And um, from there, it just took off. It was kind of wild. Like we were, I remember we were on tour with uh, a band called Anti Flag, and all of a sudden, uh, our manager was like, "Oh, you know, so and so from this label, and so and so from this label want to come see you guys, or they want to take you guys to dinner or lunch or something." And it got really weird. And it was right at the time where. Um, a lot of bands from the genre that we got lumped into were getting picked up by majors. What's that genre? Uh, I think they were calling it Screamo at the time, <laughs> uh, which we hated. Um, we just wanted to be a band, and it was that way from the beginning. Um, we'd, you know, we'd be on a, a show that was billed as punk, and then we'd be on a show that was billed as rock, and a show that was billed as hardcore. Yeah. But we didn't want to be a part of any particular scene. We just wanted to play as much as we could, wherever we could. I think that's how all bands are, right? Like, nobody sets out to start a screamo band. Right. I, I mean, in Orange County, there, <laughs> there was definitely yeah. a very distinct Orange County hardcore scene that was incredibly clicky. And I think maybe that might have pushed us away from wanting to be ever be a part of a genre. Um, it was was really clicky and kind of incestuous. Like this band would start and it was this guy from this band and this guy from this band. And we'd play shows with those bands and, uh, never really be accepted. So we're just like, screw this. Like, let's just do our own thing and make music we want to make. How often do you fantasize about killing the other guys in your band? (laughs) My brother never. Um, now I we get along really well. Uh, we took a hiatus in 2012 or 13 for about three years, and I was pretty angry about that to be honest, because uh, I made a lot of sacrifices and kind of pushed my life in a direction that was best for the band, and that it was going away, and I had no control over it. Uh, bum me out yeah and that's a common story with drummers is that you know your identity is rooted in a project 
and often you don't have much control over the direction that project takes. Totally. I mean, I'm grateful to have a voice in, you know, songwriting decisions and uh, that, that, you know, music ideas I have, you know, whether it's on guitar or keys or drums or whatever are entertained. Um, I'm thankful to have a voice in the business side of the band. But uh, with this decision, it was just like, we're not doing this anymore. I don't know if we're going to do it anymore. We might, but uh, it, we're done. So what did you do during that time? Like, oh, was, man. It, was it healthy? No, it was not healthy at all. Okay. Because some people might have said, all right, this is an opportunity to redefine myself and like get in touch with what else I want to do. But right. What did you do? Uh, I, I started teching. Uh, I teched for. I thought you were going to say I started shooting heroin. No, 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 no. I didn't. I didn't go that dark. Um, <laughs> so I started teching for Jimmy Eat World. I did like one tour and a few one-offs uh, with that. And as I was out on the road doing that, I was kind of in my brain the whole time saying maybe the band ending was a sign for me to do something else. Like this yeah. teching is great. I'd rather be playing if I'm on the road, to be honest, but. Uh, maybe I need to go home and find a job and do the, you know, nine to five thing for a while. So I ended up getting a job, terrible job, um, working for like a high end suit company. Um, it was like a clothing designer. Um, you were designing clothes. I was not designing clothes. Oh, okay. I was a sales rep. Okay. So I would wear a three piece suit to work every day and cold call people every day, cold email people every day, and just try to sell suits for this guy. Who would you be cold emailing and cold calling? Just lawyers, commercial realtors, uh, just investment bankers, anybody who looked or, like they worked at a successful job and could afford what we made, <laughs> I was supposed to call. Okay. And what are your feelings on a three-piece suit versus a two-piece suit? Like, is the vest still in or what? I think you can look really sharp in a three-piece suit. Um, a lot of people think it's too stuffy, but depending on you know how you utilize it, I think you can look really sharp. But I, I prefer to not wear a vest because I feel like I'm a hot dog. Like I'm just uh -huh. like wrapped up too tight. Was it basically like Glen Gary, Glen Ross? I haven't seen that. Oh fuck! Oh wait a minute. Is that the, the coffees for closers? Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So where did you get your list of contacts from? Like they gave that to you or you were responsible for just figuring out who to call? Uh, they started me with a list and then uh, I just had to scour the internet and LinkedIn and everything. It was terrible. It was so soul crushing. And what did you like? Did <laughs> What did you discover about yourself during this time? That I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> so did you did you start concocting a plan for something else to do? No, I was like, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to find a way to make it work. But I would like go home miserable every night and I would bum my wife out and I'd be bummed out. And I kind of like, did you have kids at this point? Uh, no. Okay. No, it was right around the time that I got married. So, um, yeah, <laughs> new, new marriage and I'm working a nine to five that I hate and, uh, hating myself when I'm home. And it was, it was really rough. It was just, I don't know, that world of uh, super wealthy A-type people and me being kind of a self-deprecating, not super confident, uh, non-A-type person uh, did not mesh well. Did you get good at faking confidence? No. No. So you no. weren't that good of a salesman? <laughs> no, I wasn't good. I wasn't good, but I was like, I can figure this out. I can find a way to do this. And I tried. I gave it a good year, and then I was just like, I can't take it anymore. And then the band came back? Uh, no. Then I started teching for Pat and Scott from Weezer. I uh, made some calls. I was like, I got to get back on the road or get back into music. Like, this suit and tie thing is not working for me. Um, so I did that on and off because they don't really tour on a regular schedule. So I just dip in and dip out. Um, I worked in a warehouse as kind of a jack of all trades for a like athletic apparel startup. Um, I was just jumping all over the place. I did some uh, freelance writing for a while uh, for sports 
websites. And you also had an advice column, right? I did. That was a long time ago, though. That was like 2006, 2007-ish in alternative press, yeah. So you already had an advice column. You'd had a successful band, and now here you are selling suits <laughs> yeah. to assholes. That, that I can't afford. <laughs> yeah. That was the hardest part, too. It's like I'm selling things that there's no way I could possibly afford, and then I'm trying to sell them to people who could buy and sell my entire existence in a heartbeat and not even think twice about it. How was your relationship with money affected during that time? I, I know, lost a lot of money. <laughs> well, I know like for me, I would have been just the way that I think I would have been like, these fucking assholes, I'm smarter than them. I, I should have money too. And I would have been really hard on myself. What was your mindset? What were you thinking about? Uh, I don't know. I think there was like a level of jealousy of yeah. like, that's what, these what guys saying. are so comfortable <laughs> and they don't have to worry about a fucking thing uh, outside of, you know, making more money, but like just crazy houses and crazy cars and never freaking out about a mortgage payment or freaking out about bills or, you know, going paycheck to paycheck. They're just like, I got this covered and tons of exp- uh, disposable income. And um, there was jealousy and I was really struggling financially because um, I wasn't making a lot of money selling suits because I sucked at it. And, uh, Yeah, it just made me more bitter, I think. This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. If 25-year-old Riley were to write into an advice column, what would he be concerned about? And then what would 40-year-old Riley respond with? I had this weird thing where I was like, when I'm 25, I'm going to be married and I'm going to have kids and I'm going to have a house and blah, 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 because that was like what my dad did. Right. And I had none of that. I think I was living with my parents. I had very little money. So you did have a house. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Living with my parents or like hopping around on couches or like renting tiny rooms for 300 bucks a month or something. Um, I had a crappy just side job. And then I had a band that I really liked, but I didn't know if anything was going to happen with it. And I kind of went through this existential crisis of just like, I've failed to meet my self-imposed, my self-imposed deadline yeah. of success. So what would you say to that guy now? Take a breath, take a knee, <laughs> like just take it easy. Um, yeah, don't, uh, don't stress as much. I mean, I still stress now for other reasons. Yeah, but what do you stress about now? Um, raising my two kids the right way. Um, what does that mean? I don't know. Like my son's two and he's so impressionable and he's, you know, starting to form memories and learning speech and experiencing the world for the first time. And it's so amazing to watch that happen. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, am I guiding him in the right way or is he getting the right experiences or am I was I a good dad today? Was I a good dad today? Was I a good dad today? Every, every day I go through that. And, um, I don't know. Is it helpful to ask yourself that question? I don't think so. (laughs) Cause it just stresses me out more, but I can't turn. Now he's just picking up on your neuroses. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, geez. (laughs) Um, I think your goal should be for him to be the baseball player you never were. And if you just start putting on the pressure now, I'm trying. He might get there. <laughs> <laughs> he can take care of you. By the time he's 25, yeah, perfect. he'll be married and he'll... Perfect. Yeah, he'll be a Cy Young contender and it'll be good. Yeah. Do you worry more now that you have kids or any less now that you have more experience? Or what, like, what do you think about? Um, I think about my kids a lot and my wife a lot and providing for my family a lot. 
Does your wife work? Uh, not right now, because we, we have a four-month-old daughter, too. So oh, wow. Okay. She's with the daughter most of the day, and then I'm with my son most of the day when I'm home. And then when I'm on the road, she's juggling two babies, which is a tremendous task, but she does a great job with it. How did you guys meet? Uh, we actually met in high school. Um, she was a freshman when I was a senior, and I kind of knew who she was. Um, and then we ended up being in the same homecoming or prom dance party together. She went with a friend of mine, and I went with some other gal. And um, then, you know, I went off to college. I didn't think twice about her. And uh, I'm trying to think what year this was, maybe 2008 or 2009. Um, the band singer's wife was at a bar in Corona Del Mar and sat down at the bar and my future wife was sitting next to her and they started talking for whatever reason. Um, and then our singer's wife started talking about what her husband did and said, Oh, you, Oh, you went to university high school. Yeah. My, my husband's in a band with a guy who went to university high school, this guy, Riley. And she was like, what Riley? Whoa. And uh, they kept talking, and then um, I got a text from our singer's <laughs> wife, and she yeah. was like, you should call this, this gal. And I was like, okay. So maybe you didn't arrive at, at the uh, picturesque, kind of idealized family life that you had envisioned for yourself by the age of 25, but mm -hmm. at, you know, at the age that you are now, are you where you want to be? Yes, do you feel like the, some of that pressure is off or are you just putting it on in new ways? I think I'm putting it on in new ways. It's just being, being a provider um, and being a father and a husband. Uh, you know, I, I was single for a long, long time uh, during the early days of the band. And uh, I think part of that was just me being afraid of being attached because I felt like we with the band, we were just like all over the place. And you know, the band was my girlfriend, basically. Um, so, you know, to settle down was always too daunting of a, a task for me to undertake, I feel like. So if the band goes on another hiatus, mm -hmm. do you feel like you're in a place where you have more of a complete life and you'll be less kind of taken aback? I think I'll be less stressed. Um, I, I think I'll always be stressed about, um, just providing for my family, but, um, I think I'm in a better place now emotionally and mentally and professionally than I ever have been probably. If the band could go on for the next 40 years, would you want that to happen? Yeah. I love it. Is there anything else that you want to try that you haven't gone for yet? I want to try more things. I think for, for a long time, um, the easiest answer for me was always no, because I would convince myself that it wasn't a good idea or that I couldn't do it. Um, and as I've gotten older, I think I've gotten a little bit better at saying yes and just jumping into it, like teching for Weezer, for example. Yeah. I got the call and I was like, Oh yeah, I'd love I'd love to get back on the road. Who's the band? And they're like, it's Weezer, and I'm like, that's too big of a band for me. Like, I'll I'll fuck this up somehow. And I where does that into lack it. of confidence come from? I think it's uh, I think part of it is genetic. Really, in a weird way. Well, my mom was the same way, but it was something that she has told me that her mom instilled in her. So it's like maybe going down the line, just never, never thinking that you're quite doing good enough, you know? Yeah. And I think sometimes people that have that mindset at a certain point embrace it for better or worse and try to use it towards their benefit. Like, okay, well maybe if I just think that I'm shitty, then I'll get good in spite of myself. Mm -hmm.
What about your dad? I mean, what kind of lawyer was he? Uh, he did like real estate litigation, um, property disputes and stuff like that. Um, but he was like, he came from a really, really strict upbringing and uh, he was in the Navy for a while and was very, very straight laced and very by the book with everything that he did, um, which I think is part of the reason why I might be more meticulous than a lot of people. Do you make your bed every morning? I don't. My wife does. <laughs> <laughs> Do you insist that there are military corners on the bed? No, but my dad did. He did when you were growing yep. up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Do you think that that was good for you? Yeah, I think it taught me discipline. Um, but then like like most teenagers... You just want to tell everybody to fuck off and do your own thing. So that was probably good for you, too, to rebel. In a way, yeah. And he was a big jazz fan. Yes. What kind of stuff did he listen to? Miles Davis, Coltrane, Cannonball Adderley. So, like, really good stuff. Brubeck, yeah. Yeah, 50s, 60s. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I just had Cannonball's drummer uh, on the show. I'm always shocked if somebody likes that kind of music and they're conservative. I feel like Mm -hmm. in order to enjoy that kind of music, you have to be open-minded to a certain extent. Yeah. Not that, not that being conservative means you're not open-minded necessarily. Right. But it seems like your dad was a complex guy. Yes. Was it a shock when he passed away? Uh, no. Well, yes and no. Um, he had, uh, like throat cancer. Um, was he a smoker? Yes. Not for my entire life, but he smoked in high school. I think smoked in college, smoked when I was little and then quit for a majority of my time at home and then started up again when I was like 18 or something and then smoked until he passed away. But, um, So he was diagnosed with cancer in 2009, I think. And then he was gone by 2011. And it Mm -hmm. was fast and awful. And uh, yeah, I I watched him go in our house. And it was the hardest. It's still like, I still fucks with me. Like, how does it fuck with you? Like just thinking about it uh, or Mm -hmm. seeing somebody that... Cause, cause I went through something similar mm-hmm. and, um, I can remember that feeling of powerlessness. <laughs> like you want to oh. do something. Yeah. Uh, and there's really nothing to be done. That's yeah. It's really hard to deal with that. Were there any positive, uh, things that came of that as far as just like a new resolve or a new way of looking at life or taking, taking stock and, and, and realizing the preciousness of uh, your time with your children, did did any of that kind of happen, or did it just fucking suck? Uh, I mean, there were some there were some positive things that I took away. I think trying to you know, be more productive and and make the most of of each day, and um, I, I guess be as good of a dad to my kids as as he was to me, because he was. He was a really awesome dad, um, but it really fucking sucked. Like to watch him deteriorate uh, that quickly, and there was just never any good news. Every time he'd go to the doctor, he'd be yeah. like, "Nope, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse." Until he was on hospice care, and then you know we're sitting in our living room and watching like a ESPN thirty for thirty, and all of a sudden he starts ch- choking. And then he's dead in a matter of minutes. And I'm sitting there saying, you're all right. You're all right. You know, and he wasn't all right. Mm -hmm. And it's, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Like it's, it's the most helpless I can imagine feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And just watching somebody who is a rock for you through your entire life just fade out and then realize that it's not there anymore. My brother described it as like, just if gravity disappeared, right? Like it's just thing that's always been there that keeps you where you're supposed to be. And you can always lean on and it's just not there. And it's not cause it's on vacation. It's cause it's not there anymore. So 
it seems like to a certain extent, um, you know, the core values that you were raised with are still with you, but then you've kind of, um, adapted and, and, and made your own way through life. Mm -hmm. So like, what's your strategy for raising your own kids and, and how is it similar to what you got from your parents and, and in which ways have you kind of changed it up? That's the thing about parenting is like, you don't really know how to do it. And you can go online and read articles about, the, you know, this is what you do when your son does this or when your son does that. But every day there's something new that I've got to figure out. And um, I just try to keep him happy and healthy and um, show him new things and uh, share some of the things that make me happy with him. Um, whether it's baseball or music or he loves drums, which is awesome to me. Um, looking for bugs. I mean, just the tiny, tiny things and, um, just trying to make him as happy as possible, but not spoil him. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, is there anything else that, uh, you wanted to discuss? Um, I have a, a side project that just put out a record. Uh, it's called less art. Um, it's kind of a, heavy, uh, drive like Jehu unwound, uh, quicksand snap Casey kind of, uh, in, in a lot of ways, a tribute to some of the seminal kind of post hardcore bands, I guess, um, that I'm in with, uh, two. I like to call it pre screamo. Yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> any, any box that you would like to put us in would be great. Um, but it's, it's just super heavy down tuned sludgy, um, really fun stuff to play. Um, that's a little more discordant than what thrice does. So it's, it's fun to scratch that itch. Cause I listen to a lot of that music, but it's with two guys from a band called Calhoun walled city. And then, uh, my friend Mike who sang for a hardcore band called curl up and die. Uh, now that you are somewhat of a local celebrity and you're in a successful band, uh -huh. have you been able to parlay that into meeting any of your baseball heroes? Yes. Who have you met? Um, I met Mark Trumbo, who plays for the Baltimore Orioles, um, when he was with the Angels. Um, he used to tweet out a pregame playlist that he was stuff he was listening to to get him pumped up, and I realized that he liked a lot of the bands that I liked, and a lot of bands that kind of sound similar to to Thrice. And I was like, I'm going to hit him up and see if he wants our new record. Um, so I. I hit him up and he was like, yeah, I'd love to hear it. Um, so, uh, I ended up getting him a copy and he had me out to batting practice. Um, and we started chatting and he's super into music. He plays drums, he plays guitar. He's into a lot of the same bands that I'm into. Um, and I think he kind of wanted to be a musician. I mean, I, I know he wanted to be sure. a base baseball player too, but so I get to pick his brain about baseball and he gets to pick my brain about touring and studio stuff. And, um, we developed a pretty, pretty good friendship and, and I've kept in touch ever since. And through that, I've met, you know, a lot of the angels guys. Um, I'm, I'm like sensing a reality show happening out of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been cool. I mean, he's had me out to batting practice a bunch of times and, it's just rad to be able to ask somebody like, what's it like to face Chris sale or like, what's how good is Justin Verlander or how fast does it look when you're facing Chapman? Like, wow. Um, when I was a kid, my dad was a massive brewers and brewers fan. And before that, when he was a kid, he was a big Braves fan when they were in Milwaukee and he kind of did some nonprofit work for the brewers and, I ended up getting to meet Hank Aaron. Whoa. Um, one time. And once my dad bid on a batting lesson from Paul Molitor and my brother and I got to take a lesson with him. That like rules. when I was like 10. <laughs> that is so rad. Um, and I, the thing that I remember most is that he showed up and he was wearing like these big ass, like zebra Zubaz pants. Oh no. <laughs> that was such a ter terrible era. <laughs> and it came back like not that long ago too. And I think that's a good place to end it. <laughs> <laughs> Riley, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. 
Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Oh,